Adventure software, which does not put us live, but it puts us almost live. Yeah. So remind me, do I need to be silent while the intro goes, or how? Uh, start? No, I can mute us. So there is. Oh, apparently we are live. <laughs> well, oh. you're doing just like Dave McGinnis and. Uh, well, we're gonna play. Star. We're gonna start early then, and we're gonna play the intro real quick. <laughs> I don't know what just happened because well, I didn't hit the uh, start stream on YouTube, but here we well, go. I mean, we're just following the steps of good people that, that, <laughs> that pretend they're uh, not online, and, and then we go online. Uh, all right. Well, we'll we'll be right back after this quick intro. All right, and we are live uh, more intentionally now, but still a little bit early because, um, yeah, yeah, at hot mic. Good thing I didn't say anything too inappropriate, huh? I mean, I was gonna, I was gonna talk about the porta potty outside, but, <laughs> but I guess we'll, I guess that that will be for another day. Uh, well, I am here once again with Landon Curtinol. It's been a little bit. Uh, I don't entirely know why, except that I was just busy and I got a lot of live streams that ended up happening, and I was just. I mean, I've got the, the daily Kent with Bent, and people have been requesting live streams on my channel and other channels, so it's it got a little crazy there. But I was like, you know what? No, it's been too long. Landon needs to come back so that we can have our long-promised discussion about science fiction, the errors it makes, as well as the ways in which it has inspired human innovation and advances in science. Because it has definitely done that. It doesn't just get things wrong, it gets things right, too. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zone and latitude from your friendly secular astronomer. It's good to be back uh, with a dinosaur, a real live dinosaur. Absolutely. Uh, and people want, and people are questioning, you know, you can see it right there. It's, uh, it's, on, it's on screen. I, can, I think I can pop, pop it up. There, there it is. There's me. See? So, uh, so uh, that, that, that's, that's always a, a pleasure. I, I have so many, I do have questions for dinosaurs too, so. Oh, well, I mean, we it, go. dinosaurs come up in science fiction sometimes. Yeah. So we, we, we could actually talk, actually there was a request that we talk about one particular group of sci-fi dinosaurs um, called the, uh, the Voth. Are you familiar with the Voth from Star Trek Voyager? I, I, yeah, I remember that, yes. Yeah, that was a, so actually, one of the questions that we I was asked uh, in the comments uh, before we even started uh, was actually, uh, how is it that the Voth, being a species of uh, hadrosaurs, essentially, that had become a sapient civilization on Earth that left after realizing that the impactor that resulted in the, you know, KPG boundary was on, their, on its way to Earth? And how could they have uh, managed to leave behind no trace of their civilization? And actually, I don't think we should expect to see any trace of a civilization that had been around for, say, maybe around as long as humans, up to several times as long, simply because everything they built would have simply eroded away, most likely. But I think the residues would be there, and the, um, the, the disruption, uh, let's say, the disruption for, for, for trying to ma manipulate one's environment to thrive would be would be there i mean that's that's what we see in 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 ontology in terms of, of tool use um we also see um extinctions of 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 critters early early humanoids were um were taking out uh, species uh, right and left uh, just like we are today although at not quite as as fast as we do today right well i mean that's certainly a good point and i suppose but one of the things I wonder is, let's say that a civilization, because it seems pretty reasonable to say that uh, up until we get to about the period where we start burning fossil fuels in human history, we're probably not having something that could be identifiable as a civilization as far as impact goes. We, there would simply be, we see a, 
a dip in biodiversity, but that doesn't mean it's a spe as a civilization. And human archaeological remains probably wouldn't survive 60 million years. So it seems to me that suppose a, a civilization only lasted for as a technological civilization for say 2,000 years, which is a fairly long time compared to how long we've been a, an advanced technological civilization. And by advanced and technological, I mean to the point where we can do things like burn fossil fuels and unlock that vast reserve of chemical energy to get really big stuff done. Would there be much evidence beyond a, a isotropic excursion in the geological record? Well, it's good. That's a that's a good question. Um, one thing that that seems to me is that uh, the uh, prior to you know fossil fuels, you know petrochemicals. Prior to that, we certainly had a lot of use of coal, and so mining is something that you might um, detect and be which oh, would see the disruption. Point. Even so, we can see uh, and think about from the the again. It's, it's only two thousand years ago, but. Things in the Roman times, we can detect some of their megastructures, such as roads, yeah. um, and uh, the cities that are in. I mean, the for example, out in Sahara Desert in Libya, um, there are are some pretty amazing Roman ruins. Like some of the best Roman ruins are actually found in North Africa, where right. the sands covered them up. They weren't looted and 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 uh, as, as much. And and those structures, I mean, those the the marble. The marble roads that the Romans built out into the desert um, are going to last for for quite some time, and 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 why? Because they're 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 stone structures, and it's their arrangement mm -hmm. that we can see as being civilized, even this, even though it's it's pre. Right. Um, uh, good. But but you 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 raise a good question in terms of what what is you know, is you know how would we detect civilization comes down to what do you define as civilization? I mean, would would the Neanderthals and their um, their society be considered civilization? Well, so as someone with a history degree, this is actually a question that that uh, I've wrestled with a, a considerable amount because um, it's yeah, actually so why, that's, why, that's why I asked you because right. you're a subject matter expert, right? <laughs> so it's it's actually a really interesting question, and um, one of the things that historians tend to fall back on is just sort of looking at the etymology of the word civilization because it finds its root in the Latin word for city. And mm -hmm. so for most historians, civilizations require there to be some degree of urbanization. So there has to be, there has to be a sedentary culture, so they're not nomads, and they have to be building artificial structures that are meant for long-term inhabitation in numbers beyond what can be, uh, what is normally the maximum for like a hunter-gatherer group. Because it, as it turns out, fairly consistently, hunter-gatherer groups have trouble getting much past about 80 or so individuals because it's just very hard to coordinate that many people actively. Well, I mean, think in the case of, uh, I'm thinking when you're, when you're testing your, your process here, um, is, is it, I mean, the nomadic group, the Tuareg that I uh, spent so weeks with in, in, in the Har Desert, mm -hmm. While they were, they are nomadic in terms of, of of they particularly go from spot to spot. They have favorite places. They they frequent places, yeah, um, and and go back to places. And and you can tell their presence, even though they may not be residing there all the time. Right, their presence at a location is 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 seen and is is known quite well. And uh, um, so I would say one thing is that 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 um. You know, a, a a purely wandering nomadic uh, group is different than a people who don't have a f hardcore city, city city structure, but instead go from spot to spot. Right. Perhaps because the environment requires compels them to move from place to place as opposed to staying in any one spot. Right, and I think there we're getting into sort of the the gradient problem because. Yeah, everything. Well, I can't say everything, but things in reality have a tendency not to fit neatly into the boxes that humans would like them to. There are exceptions. Exactly, exactly. And, and so, you know, people that 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 follow the wildebeest uh, herds in the Serengeti are nomadic in one sense, but they're also quite pragmatic in another sense. And and they have structures. One of the things I think that you have to look at is is I mean, a, a distinction spot is is can a group get to the point where some people can f afford 
to specialize in some tactic, be it religious nature, medical nature, uh, uh, arts and crafts, tool making, such that they don't have to go out and forage for themselves. So the difference between a herd of elephants where every element has to go and, and eat right. before it dies to uh, that, that's a different type of, of, a, of and they, oh, they have a social group. Right. You get that division of labor going on. Yes. And that's and, another and, thing and that to historians be able, to be able to specialize, to be able to specialize. So, so somebody can, can withhold um, trying to gain sustenance and instead count on other people to do that. Why? Because they count on them for their specialized skill. That I think is a, is, is, is where I think I, I see as an important distinction. Now, what you call that uh, society level group, I, I don't know, but, but I think that's a, an important. Oh, I think thing. so too. And, and then these are even questions to, to, and by the way, that's, that's another thing that historians sometimes will use as their definition. Cause there actually isn't really a consensus among historians as to what groups we consider civilizations and what groups are cultures, but not civilizations. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and to bring it to the, the whole sci-fi yeah. thing that co actually comes up a fair bit in various ideas about, uh, think first contact situations where we, especially where we have, um, situations in, in science fiction where you get this idea where humans go out and they find a planet that is not as technologically developed and there's organisms there that may be of similar intelligence. And then there's questions as to how do you interact with them? And it can help us. One of the great things about sci-fi is that it can, it can take real societal questions like, you know, the effects of colonialism, how technologically advanced people should interact with uh, relatively uh, non-advanced people. So for instance, there are uncontact tri contacted tribes in the Amazon, right? Should you contact them? If you do, how should you do it? Should you expose them to foreign cultures, to what extent. And so one of the nice things about sci-fi is that we can take these questions and by removing the real world details, we can look at it in a more abstract way without that sure. sort of involvement because sure. you might have a particular bias about some of that that is easier to get rid of if instead of uncontacted tribes in the Amazon, it's squiggly aliens with four eyes. Yeah. So, so I think... You know the thing you're talking about. You know, because the, the 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 topic in the show is about science fiction. Yes. And 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 science, right? Yes. And, and how they relate. And and how they relate. And and um, besides simply the fact that science fiction has science in it, um, it it is. I mean, they the they. I think they are related in terms of, for example, how one inspires um one inspires the other and 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 by the way you know, they usually say well science fiction inspires science well science also inspires science fiction as well Oh, definitely and and so but but you know we and so the, us, the usual things that that that, that we say you know that, that, that there are certainly there are certainly inventions whose who you know of, of modern inventions that you can go back and look at somebody who was, um, you know, uh, in writing, in in fiction and imagining, and you say, well, did they invent it? Like, for example, um, Jules Verne and his 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 sort of description of the submarine, right? Twenty thousand leagues under the sea. By the way, that's that's not a depth. That's the number of that's the amount of time. That, that's supposedly that's the a league is a dis you know a distance, and so it's twenty thousand yes. leagues of travel. Under the ocean, right? right? The what, ocean actually what, isn't that deep. Um, yes, and so, but 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 again, did say what did 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 Jules Verne invent the submarine? No, but he is a person who who wrote about the the topic of of a device we now know as a submarine, right? And and all of the various things that. Um, are there? So he, you know, he wrote about his 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 twenty thousand leagues was in eighteen seventy, and the first submarine was actually successfully operated in the ocean in eighteen ninety eight. Now, did he invent it? No, but but certainly the, the the concept was there, and and oftentimes in in scientific inventions, it's rare that something comes out of the blue. Like, where did that inspiration come from? It it tends to be someone building on top of ideas of others, right. and those ideas come from sometimes science fiction come from science come from from attempts at something 
Um, and 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 so the 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 thing I think that 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 science fiction gives is a ability to have an imagination free of most of the technological requirements and the and the um, you know the engineering processes. Absolutely. And I think that uh, we can look and see a lot of things actually that have been to various degrees uh, either predicted or inspired by um, science fiction. Like, I, I don't know of too many people who've seen the original Star Trek series who then didn't make the connection to flip phones that came out eventually. Sure. And, and uh, you know, as the communicator. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. we have uh, all sorts of things like that. In fact, even just the idea of, you know, uh, like, the various uh, rocket ships that we can see in certain sp science fiction, you know, ideas like this were in science fiction before they were real. And it's, this is yeah. back and forth relationship where, you know, uh, imaginative science fiction writers will take the science as they find it and then yeah. iterate on what seems possible to them. And then some engineer or inventor will say, well, could I do a thing like that? Because now it's in the zeitgeist. Well, but but also the fact that 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 let's take you know, take for example um, the helicopter, uh, mm -hmm. um, the 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 Russian Sussorsky, um is is accredited with the invention of the modern helicopter, uh, but there were people attempting rotary flight before Sussorsky. <laughs> Russian names, right? Yes. Um, and um, Igor Sikorsky, and um, Sikorsky, and he Sikorsky, and he, um, and and so he didn't invent the helicopter out of, of thin air. Now, Jules Verne had a uh, had a book called Clipper of the Clouds that described a rotary plane. Right, but but understand that if you go back farther, you'll see that other people were talking about this sort of concept. But what what I mean, Verne did was to take a concept which people had been thinking about and and bring it to really bring it to life right in terms of in, in the imagination um now it, did Jules Byrne invent on the whole cloth no there are things where you can look at Leonardo da Vinci and had drawings of things that we call helicopter like and 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 and, and back farther so in some ways these kind of inspirations don't come out of thin air they come out of the of the, the the product of the times. The thing that science fiction does for society and for science is realizing what's what's in back in back of people's minds and and putting it putting it you applying pen to it to give it shape and to give it concrete imagination. That's I think is the, is the is the um, you know part of the of the importance of science fiction. Yeah, and I think that that's a, that's a really important thing. It's not, I mean, it is in many cases just entertainment, but it can also be much more than that, um, both in terms of social commentary, in terms of inspiration for technological achievement. Um, but we also do have the word errors in here. So real quick, I want to get at some of your favorite sci-fi mistakes where they got the science wrong and they could have known better at the time. Hmm. I was, I was sort of focusing on all, all of the things they got right, but but I think we have to do um, a little bit of both. I, 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 I would say that one <laughs> of the things that that seems to be um, where science fiction runs into problems is when it tries to predict the future, as opposed to it's fiction. Let's explore what this fiction might be like, and okay. that I think that's where science fiction is successful when it tries to become a a prognosticator of truth. Then I think it runs in, into problems. I, um, I tend to agree. And, and one thing that's fun is always looking at sci-fi that is dated in what is now the past and look yeah. at their predictions about the future. So I mean, flying cars is, a, is, is one of the examples that science fiction has failed miserably on. Yep. Now, if, if what science fiction had done is talked about cars that fly and the society that might, the things about society and what it might mean or build stories around it, that would be useful for us to kind of imagine that situation. Right. Uh, I think it's when, when science fiction becomes, tries to state the future and predict the future become 
try to become when it tries to, to state fact, um, then it's there. I mean, there's there's a there's a there's an old TV series back in the '60s um, called Year 2001, and they talk about predicting what life will be like in 2001, and it's it's kind of a, a a drama type thing and so forth. But again, you look at those predictions and you say, well, you know, it, they would have been better off creativity talking about a a society envisioned in the future rather than saying in the year 2001 we will have blah. Right. Did they get anything right? Because I assume they, most things they got wrong. Hey, yeah, it, it, it varies on, on, on stuff um, okay. as, 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 they, as they talk about. Um, now, you know, one of the things, another thing is that, that you're talking again about the positive contributions. Um, and again, um, we don't have to, we can go back to earlier items. Um, um, H.G. Wells had a, had a, a important novel called uh, about, about a Mars invasion called War of the Worlds. And um, it was actually, he, he actually released it in, in, in 1898 as a as sort of a, a newspaper serialization. You, you would mm-hmm. go to the newspaper and read the latest, you know, the latest he bit out in bit, dribbles and babs to get people to, to, to buy newspapers. Um, and uh, no less than uh, Robert Goddard, um, the, the one of the American scientists that built the first liquid fuel rocket um, launched his rocket in 1926. And he said that rating of Wells's novel was a, was a real awakening for him because the concept of interplanetary travel was something that, 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 you know, Wells imagination, he could see in his mind, the interplanetary travel and, and he could see the value in trying to develop um, rocketry. Now, rockets had been around for a while. I mean, people had fireworks. People in military had basically, you know, things that 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 that, right. that shot out by propellants. So it isn't the case that that Goddard was the inventor of the rocket or Wells. He was the first person to successfully have a liquid fuel rocket launch. But but he he was inspired by Wells to say. It's possible that things could go from one planet to another. That's a, that was a possibility that those planets aren't out there beyond our reach. Their 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 targets can be reached. Let's let's get working on rockets to see how we can do it. And that was his that was inspiration because he said otherwise I would have just been happy with as he said he was kind of a pyromaniac too blowing things <laughs> up and and having you know basically firecrackers and and fireworks stuff right that would be nice and that was fun but but the development of more efficient and particularly the fuel uh filled rockets and and not only just that goddard's thing was not just that he got the first one going successfully launched but he also began to develop a lot of techniques about what's good and what's bad right right Um, because they had a lot of launch failures um and here again um you know, science fiction established the perhaps in people's minds with things like Wells's novel, mm-hmm. the importance of of rockets and what it might be like in the future. So there's a case where the you know Wells is. I think Wells would have been quite pleased to uh, learn about our Mars rovers and and Mars rockets um, from there. And at some point, we will get a return mission. Right. That's one of the goals and as a planetary scientist one of the things i'd like to get is actual mars samples back here right and that will be the first because we've launched rockets to mars but we've not taken something from mars and had it return right. and and that's that that'll be the ultimate um uh, you will the 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 realization of wells's uh uh novel is the ability to travel between planets right and not just to go out there and drop something off and I, I think that that is definitely the case. And I, interestingly, I think another thing that um, you can look at in uh, this, that example, the War of the Worlds, is if you remember, uh, you know, I'm sure you remember, Landon, but more the audience, if you remember, the, what ultimately defeats the Martians isn't some military maneuver or wonderful new invention. It's simply that they neglected to maintain sufficient uh, controls against microbes. Yeah, and they were infected by bacteria that they simply had no native ability to fight off. And yeah. one of the things that currently NASA is concerned about 
is sufficiently sterilizing uh, spacecraft that they send to other planets on the off chance that they do things like uh, either contaminate other planets with Earth life, or they trigger false positives on uh, missions to detect life. So, for instance, various Martian probes have been launched with uh, probes that were designed to detect indications that there could be life on Mars. But if you're already coated in bacteria from Earth, who might be able to survive that journey, how do you know that's not a false positive? Yeah. Well, right now, of course, we have no... Um firm you know we have no firm firm signals of de of, of of detection we have right. we have had things that might be interesting but but also understand like like, like the viking landers that or some of the for, some of the one of the first one of the, one of the first very successful landers and probes that stayed on the surface of mars and gave us you know a, a lot of very good data was the the viking lander um it you know, it was a 1970s mission carrying 1960s laboratory technology. Right. So its its analysis was not that crude. It's one of the reasons why there's another. You know, um, you know, there's 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 going to be a science laboratory launched to to Mars uh, fairly soon. That is going to be what we might call modern day, um, you know, detection systems, specifically doing things like be able to look at the you know, the element isotope mixes of, of methane that's on Mars to try to determine if it's being concentrated through a process that could be indicate biology as an example. So there's lots of things where, where that that's going to go forward. Um, but you mentioned, you know, in, in terms of, of detecting civilization, the civilization's use of fuel and power is something that is, 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 is quite critical to, to, to detect. And it probably is one of the larger impacts that a civilization has on its environment. Oh, definitely. You know oh, yeah. Uh, and one of the interesting things is if you look at um, human energy consumption, as humans become more technologically advanced, the amount of energy that any given human uses starts to go up geometrically. It's it's crazy. Um, mm -hmm. And you don't think about it because a lot of the things you do, you don't they're not burning your own calories, right? You're burning, uh, you know, calories from coal or solar panels or nuclear power plants or hydroelectric plants. But like right now, my computer is burning way more calories than I do biologically. If you're going to, cause I mean, calories are just right. a measurement of energy. I mean, it's like a yeah. jewel. Yeah. We typically yeah. don't measure computing power in uh, power use in terms of, you know, calories per second, but there's no reason you can't. Yeah. Um, and so, and yeah, the wattage of, of the thing and the voltage, you know, the wattage will give you sort of power. Yeah. And, consumption. Yep. And power is just energy per time. And I mean, technically, you can measure power in calories per second if you want to. Yeah. Well, I don't see why you would, but yeah. I mean, it, that's one of the things. And that's, um, that's actually one of the things that science fiction has tried to tackle with ideas like uh, megastructures to capture significant proportions of a star's output each second. Sure. Sure. And, and again, the the notion of looking for search for extraterrestrial life, um, one of those things is looking that SETI does is looks for possible signs of of those kind of structures. But the power source is also something that can can expose itself over long distances. Um, you know, another thing, and again, I keep bringing up H. C. Wells, but he was he was very good in things with science science literate as well as an excellent writer and could take a scientific concept, imagine it, and, and write about the implications of that imagination. So one of the things he did, there's a, there's a book he has, um, The World Set Free, where Wells talked about artificial energy, what he called, what we, you know, we called atomic energy, this, this sort of notion of, of a, a world that had so much energy, right? But then it, it was followed by a devastating war and this global, peace movement that came out of it um, with this energy. And of course, um, you know, his, his book predated in 1914, predated some of the first uh, sustaining chain reaction, right. uh, you know, things that, that, that was done. Now, if you, if you looked at that time, atomic physics was, was, was getting to be known and being to be understood, but, um, but you know, that, that, that again, science fiction doesn't do it in a vacuum either. 
maybe what, what science fiction authors are good, are good authors can do is take a scientific concept or a, a little result in, in, in someone's hypothesize and, and extrapolate out to what ifs. Right. And actually it's interesting. You, you've mentioned even the, um, the, the peace movement and things like that, because I mean, you look at say like the sixties and the seventies and there was a really big anti-atomic, especially when it comes to atomic weapons movements and things like that. That's, I mean, it hasn't gone away. It's just no longer on the forefront of most people's minds. But I think it's interesting that even beyond the technology and the science, there's often yep. um, some ability to imagine potential societal outcomes of sure. new technologies that yep. are plausible. Yeah. And um, actually, that, that ties into something that's currently popular as far as uh, sci-fi, which is um, The Expanse, which goes a lot into things like um, humans who have been in microgravity intergenerationally and the trouble that they face in sure. existing in higher gravity environments. So one of the things yeah. about the the uh, the setting there, because it all takes place in the solar system, and the only form of artificial gravity that anyone has is either rotation or just straight up accelerating via burning your yeah. rocket. And so most people have grown up in uh, Mars or less gravity throughout the solar system, and they find it extremely difficult to visit Earth. And as a result, uh, many people who grew up on Earth have sort of a superiority complex because they can do things like go outside without an environment suit. And they can visit anywhere in the solar system without having to worry that they'll be crushed. Sure. And so well, they're sort of an upper yeah. class. And, and, and that's kind of the thing of, of, the, of the notion, because sometimes science fiction kind of, of, of glosses over stuff for, for plot device. I mean... The number of how number of times that a Star Trek scout team lands on a planet and finds it nice, breathable, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, versus the chances of of an atmosphere being like that, you know, is, is there? But but again, it's for for so so science fiction can get away with things for plot devices are there now. Um, but again, they can because they can remind me of the uh, remind us of the implications. I, mean, I think um, you know it was. Early, earlier in in the stream, um, that that one of the things that uh, uh, I think it was as was Taco said, you know, if 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 humans ever go there, there's no way to go to guys to Mars. There's no way to pretend prevent contamination, right? And that's actually that's actually quite true. It's one of the things where where um, I would like to see um, Mars thoroughly explored. In terms of its of its history before humans contaminated it, right? Um, and and that's one of the things why these these early probes are, are are so are so important because the I think that learning about Mars's past, um, although it, even though it seems like it 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 is without a civilization, certainly. Oh, almost um, certainly. Yeah. The question the question is has it had uh, has it had life um, in, in the past? And it had conditions where it, it, it could have, but we need to find that out. And we need to do that before we go and contaminate it um, thoroughly. <clears throat> yes, I, I agree. And I think that's one of the reasons why... Um, well, and it's one of the things is it's difficult, right? Because there are actually uh, laws in place that would protect potential Martian life. So, for instance, um, if we have good reason to think that there's liquid water on a particular area on Mars... There are actually uh, regulations saying that we're not actually allowed to drive a rover over there. You have to start looking at it uh, via satellite images. But that's also the place where you'd be most likely to detect if there's any extant biosphere on Mars. So it, it, it's a difficult thing because it would be so easy to simply spread particularly hardy and, and you know, things like an, an, uh, anaerobic and, you know, chemotrophic uh, life forms from Earth. That are, I mean, they're all over the place, right? Yeah. And, uh, and they could sure. potentially survive reasonably well even on Mars. I mean, sure, yeah. they would have a harder we've, time, but... We've gotten a lot better at, at, at sterilizing our, our probes, particularly the probes that are, you know, biological laboratories. Right. For that reason. And the other thing I could say about, about the surface of Mars is that surface of Mars is actually quite inhospitable to large organic compounds, large, large molecules. 
And the reason why is that Mars does not have an ozone layer. Right. Um, and so the sun's ultraviolet light, um, even though it's, a, it's it's slightly farther away than Earth, is still a fairly significant sterilizing technique. Right. And and you know in in terms of of surviving the on Mars, the most likely place that that the explorers should you know should should consider is underground. Not mm. on the you know, not on the surface, living underground or residing underground, and coming right. to the surface for for things. And of course, that then can give that has given rise to those concepts to science fiction books about people exploring Mars and being in those those caves. And of course, the the Martian, right? That movie is an mm -hmm. example of stuff um, where again it was a it, it see. There's a case, um, you know, thing with with the book. By the way, you should. People who like know about the the movie and Matt Damon and so forth. Um, if you read the book, you get the book goes into a much greater detail than the movie can about the process. I mean, the the, the two are pretty parallel. The book and the right. movie are pretty parallel, but but the movie glosses over lots of important things that you can um, you can gain if you actually read the book. And and here again, this is a case that I think is important if you're if you're trying to seek out ideas from science fiction. If you have it spoon fed to you through a movie screen or a TV screen where you're not thinking, you're just dumping, you're not actively engaging with the science fiction. If you read it and you take time to read it or you hear it being read to you, let's say if you can't, if you can't read, um, your imagination comes along with you. Yes. And you have the time to digest because that's there. See, there again is, is is the fact that that if you look at somebody like Goddard, he was a science fiction reader, and he was inspired by what he read, and motivated by what he read. So there's a case of there of 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 there. So if you want if you want to get inspired by it, get away from the TV, the YouTube. Uh, you know, uh, Netflix stuff and actually read a book. Or if you, if you can't read or want to read, have a book read to you through audiobook. While you're getting away from YouTube, just make sure you stay tuned into this channel. This is the exception. Well, well we're, we're, this is science <laughs> fact. I mean, this is, we, we, have, we have a living dinosaur here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> proof of, 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 of evolution. Um, I, now, there are some very direct things. And one of the things that, one of the things we should, I mean, I, I mentioned G. Wells, but another one we should really, you know, remember is Robert Highland. Um, Robert Highland had a 1942 uh, um, book about a, a a an infirmed inventor named Waldo F. Jones, who could who created things and to he was infirm, but he created devices that he could you know manipulate with a mechanical hand, and. And you know, in 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 real life, everybody you know working with very harsh environments like let's say nuclear stuff, um, where you can't get biology near it, um, they they develop those sort of mechanical hands. And in fact, they call them Waldos. I mean, the the name Waldo of that manipulator comes from Heinlein, oh, that's cool. who's who's who who wrote a short story about a a a man. Waldo F. Jones, who, because of his of, of of physical problems, created devices to manipulate his world for him, awesome. and 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 so they were they actually named it right. It was inspired a name because in the case of of it's more than just but prior to the atomic stuff and and the germ theory, you know the the worst things we had were either critters that could eat you or hot molten metal or fire or something that could burn you. Um, but when we got to things like nuclear stuff, where you couldn't get where near it, how did you, you know, how would you manipulate it and have the dexterity that right. that you, you have? And the answer is um, came from this short fiction. So again, if you're ready to list of stuff, go check out Robert Highland's short story about uh, Waldo F. Jones. Actually, um, when you mentioned uh, reading the book and. Um... And the Martian, it reminded me of one of my uh, pet peeves with Hollywood sci-fi that is not as much a problem in literature, which is that um, in Hollywood, gravity is always just on or off. And if it's on, <laughs> yeah. it's at 1G. And if it's off, it's at essentially 0G. And hmm. so um, 
Yeah, it's it's a little bit weird because even in shows that are taking into account the idea that there is different amounts of gravity. So, for instance, um, the Expanse, right? Which which we mentioned takes uh, it takes a uh, time to go into the. <laughs> uh, by, oh, sorry. by the way, um, um, Taco said, "Insert where is Waldo joke here." Oh, yeah. so, <laughs> yes. Well done. So yeah, yeah, you have it. You have it by, if 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 people that are watching this later on, you should subscribe to this channel because they've got a really good chat. Oh yes, I I'm I'm really proud of my chat. I think I have an amazing chat, honestly. Um, <laughs> and I'm not just saying that to get you guys to stay here, although you should still stay. But um, yeah, I'm sorry. No, yeah. That's right. So, he, he so, so please, even, please continue. Right. So even in in um in movies or TV shows, they're trying to go into this aspects of the effects of different gravity and things like that. And the Expanse is one of those. If you watch The Martian or The Expanse or things, there are instances where people are going around in what should be different kinds of gravity, right? So uh, in The Martian, you have scenes on on Mars, you have scenes on Earth, and you have scenes on board a spaceship that has a, a habitation ring that rotates to produce artificial gravity. Presumably, those should all produce different kind or different amounts of gravitational acceleration. And if you look at The Expanse, you have locations as diverse as Ceres, uh, Mars, Venus, Earth, Ganymede, various spaceships accelerating at different rates. And yet, anytime anything is going to fall, it's always falling at 9.8 meters per second per second. Every time. Yeah. Yeah, and that's sort of it. because of the limitations of, of, the, of, of the movie set. But, you know, Mars' is, uh, gravity, surface gravity is about 0.78. No, excuse me, 0.38 right. um, G. 0.38 G. I was going to say, so I don't think it's 30, that high. 38% 30, 30 of, of there. Because Mars is a fairly lightweight. Mm -hmm. It's small as far as rocky planets go. It's almost dwarf planet size. Um, and and it's got also not very dense either. I mean, I, I mean that, that Mars is stupid, but that the the material inside the right. Mars is not it's, packed as, as, as well as, as something like Mercury or, right. or, or Earth. A much higher proportion um, of its uh, composition is silicates yeah. as opposed to but, metals. But one of the things that I think that I wish that, that science fiction authors would explore is is you know they have the spaceship and rotating, and then somehow that's that's how they have excuses for people walking around like there's gravity. Mm -hmm. Centrifugal force is not a very nice environment, acceleration environment to be in. Not at right? small scales, at least. And 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 one of the things in particular is I I don't care how big it is. Um, if you have a rotating thing and you go across, you go through. Oh yeah. Basically, non. Mm -hmm. You know, you have you have varying degrees and your altitude to to nothing in in, in the center of the rotating object. Uh, for for first off, and so one of the things in particular, I would say, if you had some sort of rotating civilization thing, would be the problem of the stuff that gets that gets tossed up and and ends up floating in the middle, so your little your little sea of of you know, like we have the 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 plastic garbage, you know, uh, terrible islands in in the ocean. Right. Well, you'd have this sort of garbage stuff there. Um, uh, you know, uh, I mean. And and people flinging stuff in there and creating you know well mess well, in the center right <laughs> one one thing and, I could say is there's a there's a perfect plot for an author about about kids that decide to sort of you know um, go and and hang out in a trash heap in the middle <laughs> that is a nice idea although I I would say uh, it seems to me like you could solve this problem to some extent by simply having a core that is made of something solid such that anything that would get to the center would have to have enough velocity to penetrate whatever that core is made out of, which would itself be a separate problem. Yeah. But, you know, the other thing, of course, is, 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 the, is the effect that you have on rotating. You know, rotating sphere is not very nice. Right. Um, and, and so these sort, of, these sort of, of artificial things, of course, accelerating the rocket only gets you so far as long as you have fuel to accelerate. But at some point, you need to decelerate anyway. But that's Right. Usually. Well, um, actually, I I think you might be interested to know that I have uh, running on my channel a little bit of a uh, sci-fi project that is a it's primarily a collaborative speculative evolution project where um, myself and my viewers are collaborating together to take a hypothetical alien planet 
through about 480 million years worth of biological evolution uh, alongside huh. tectonic plate movements and, you know, impact yeah. events and volcanic eruptions and various things like this. Um, but one thing that you might find interesting is that um, I, in the background fiction, you know, humans have discovered this thing. That's why we know about all these extinct things and the currently living things and whatnot. And so I, um, in the background fiction, I have established that there is an orbital research station. It's quite large and it's housing several thousand people who either directly do research or perform various services that are in support of that, including various uh, tourist attraction-y type stuff. So, you know, there, there are little shops where you can go buy knickknacks from, from the planet or associated with it. But one of the things that I took into account was the fact that um, in order to get, you know, something like gravity, I really, uh, I, I put in a rotating ring and I put in counter rotation so that the whole station doesn't just feel net torque in one direction. And also, I made sure to include um, how much the gravity, how much gravitational or simulated gravity you have at the bottom floor versus the top floor. And there's actually a significant difference. At the mm -hmm. bottom floor, I made it so you're at about 0.8 Gs. And at the top floor, it goes down to about 0.6. And so there's actually a significant difference as you go, if you were to say go up sure. in an elevator, you would get significantly lighter as you go up. I think it has five or six stories. Yeah. And so, um, and also it doesn't have the problem of the center because to get that, you have to go out essentially into space, except for some elevators that can take you there for transiting to non-rotating parts of the station. Because, you sure. know, they have, they have zero G cargo storage and docking bays and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, the thing that, that uh, you know, if you say, well, okay, um, the, you know, the, 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 the father of, of liquid fuel rocketry was inspired by science fiction author. Um, one of the things I think that, that science fiction could do is be inspired by science and take note of some of the developments that we've been uh, you know, carrying out on the International Space Station in terms of practical um, experience in, in microgravity for extended periods of time and the issues. These things are not only quite important for exploring outer space by people they're also quite important for 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 understanding things here here on on earth um now you know we 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 know that for example um there, there are several problems with long-term space flight and one of them is the min the is the um bone loss problem right that 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 it appears that humans if left to, if we don't intervene, we'll begin to lose bone mass mm -hmm. um, in in microgravity over over extended periods of time. Such that if you did a you know a two year plus journey to Mars, by why would you take that long? Because you don't want to accelerate massively and then have to decelerate massively. Besides stress on 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 humans, it's, it it takes a lot of fuel to do that. Okay. Um, so you did a long term thing. The, the, the dangers that people have with regards to bone loss are essentially one of the problems that they've had some reasonable levels of partial success and the space station try to overcome. But there also still is the notion of, of radiation. Um, our sun is a nuclear fusion reactor throwing out all kinds of particles. Um, our earth has a nice magnetosphere. Um, that is a big, big magnet to deflect some of those charged particles. Occasionally, it gets down close. That's what the aurora borealis is mm -hmm. of atmosphere fluorescing. On Mars, guess what? You don't have much of a, a magnetic field uh, to, to to talk about, and so you're you're having those particle streams. That which is part of the reason why the surface of Mars is 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 quote sterilized uh, because of that of that radiation. But right. the radiation traveling on space, the X rays and sort of thing you get experience is a is a cancer problem. Um, another area that we have learned about is macular generation, right? The, the people's retinas begin to degenerate. Apparently, our eyes have evolved that depending upon gravity and extended weightlessness causes the effect of some of these macular de degeneration processes. And, and there's a very important twin study where, where they had 
uh, uh, twins and one went up to station for a year and another stayed at, down, down at earth and did the comparison of the two. And they learned some very important things about that macular degeneration. Why, if, if you have vision problems uh, or you have elderly people that have this macular degeneration, um, some of the stuff they learn on the space station is helping them try to, to process that disease. Finally, um, when I think one of the, the other, other, other big four, um, I've mentioned, I've mentioned bone loss, radiation, macular degeneration is Alzheimer's. One of the things that they, that are seeing with some of the people that have long-term stays on a space station is things that are associated with the early al onset of Alzheimer's that apparently our brain structure is such that we don't, if left our own devices, we don't do well long-term in, um, in weightless space. That's actually gotten them quite excited because normally you, you, you try to test something, you, you don't want to go there and cause Alzheimer's or wait for them to develop it. Um, having these, these biological suspens and, and neurons being exposed long term up in the space station is giving them from very valuable research into uh, insights into the brain. Right. Um, so those are things that have to be worked on. If you're talking about reaching for the stars, um, one of the things in particular is you got to be able to build a a a habitable habitable zone. Our exploration, our our human exploration from Earth has been little tiny bubbles that temporarily go up that are basically tied back and forth to Earth. Today's space station has to have frequent visits of supply, fuel, uh, and, and food, and then do what? Take waste and pull it back down. It basically gets tied to Earth. And, and if you weren't going to servicing the space station, you know, uh, every, every handful of weeks, um, you wouldn't be able to operate the space station. The, the, right. the Apollo mission landed on the moon was basically a bubble there where they basically had enough fuel and, and water and so forth to, to basically hold their breath um, while they're on the moon and came back, right? It's not, not where we kind of brought a little bubble of Earth there, promised around, amazing experiences, came back, but not to reside. So they'll say, well, why, didn't, why, why aren't we back on, on the moon? Well, long-term residing on the moon is actually not it's, it's not easy. Yeah, it's pretty difficult. So, so one of the things about in planetary exploration that is being pushed on um, is the terrarium project. You know about terrariums? If you've ever tried to, you be this bowl of 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 stuff, and you depending on how advanced your terrarium is, you might have mosses and lichens and bacteria and little plants and maybe some few bugs, and you build your sort of little ecosystem and try to keep that 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 little sphere ongoing and the idea is to have a spacecraft that has biological material in it that let's say sits at just just one au the same earth sun distance but is completely separate from earth and is able to function on its own and, right. e and evolve on its own um build a build a small system and maybe even with just simple life um and have it be able to have us be able to build an ecosystem with enough parts and enough cycles to have it sustain and have it go forward. You know, can you sustain something like that? Can you actually build for the first time a, a earthbound biological bubble that can, that can survive on its own in space without earth keeping coming and supplying it? That would be, that's, that's like, that's the baby step to be able to build an environment that humans could live in, to build an environment that could go and go to the stars. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the interesting things that you see in sci-fi is you see a, a number of these ideas for things like generation ships. And I think the most interesting ones are the ones that actually take into account the realistic needs of a long-term intergenerational sort of travel. Sure. Oh, and what are we drinking today, Landon? We always have to know. Well, I think, I think now we're going to travel to the stars. Um, I have two... Uh, I have grappe. Uh, two... I have, I have two... That's a grappa. Um, I could start with this, uh, this Italian thing, because again, um, one of the things that, that the space program is very fortunate in is that Italy has some of the finest uh, instrumentation people around. And a lot of the astronomical stuff, um, the, the Italians build amazing instrumentation and detection systems. Um, and, and we're very fortunate that, that there's, a, there's a, this, this deep, 
well of skill there for for building devices that, that operate way out in space. So in honor of that, uh, I'm going to start with this um, this particular grappa here. Okay. And uh, it's it's a uh, it's actually a, a, a it's a, it's a as I say um, nonino uh, grappa. And uh, it's a classic clear grappa. Uh, this is a, uh, I've actually got this, it's Italian, but it's actually Northern Italian right next to the um, Swiss border. So, uh, but again, you just use little bits of it. Okay. And uh, I'll then go have that and then go to the next one, which is another amazing grappa. Very nice, very nice. Did you hear that there was a such, there's now such a thing as space whiskey? Tell me about it. So I don't remember the brand, but uh, a few years ago, there was an article that was, um, it, I believe it was a, a Scottish company, so it's actually a space scotch. And mm -hmm. they had sent uh, a few barrels of their scotch. They paid exorbitantly, of course, to do this and mm -hmm. decided to see what would happen if you aged scotch inside of a barrel that was itself inside of a sealed container for a few years, I think, or maybe it was a year or a few months. Mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly, but yeah. And then they started charging astronomical amounts to get yourself a bottle of space whiskey because it had been to space. And as far as I can tell, there wasn't much else to do about it that was interesting, except that it had those molecules had physically been to space. So why, 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 why not? That's that's it. So, but but uh, I like to toast toast your marvelous chat room um, here. There you cheers. go. Cheers, cheers, chat. Which reminds me, my drink is more or less empty. So in a few minutes, I'm actually gonna have a, a little in, intermission. Yeah. I have a um, an extended intermission video because my last one was like a minute and a half long, which wasn't really enough for me to do anything. So uh, this is going to be the premiere of my slightly longer intermission video. So I hope you all appreciate that. Uh, but I think when we come back, we will start opening up a little bit of a question from the chat because as they're, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I have one of the best chats around. Um, I would like to hear what kinds of questions yeah. they have. So, so, and, and, and as I say, I, I know that we've, and, and you have, you know, have to chat, think about the, some broader views of, of science and science fiction. Um, and, and if I can talk about, so-called hard science and social science, um, there's a number of things where they're not just, it's not just space and rockets and so forth, although that's, I, 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 I love that thing, so I'm not <laughs> right at all. Yes, but, no. but certainly in hard science, you know, stuff relating to, to planet exploration and, and time travel and advanced technology and, and weapons, of course, and advanced materials and, and um, also genetics and, and evolution is something that's there. But in social sciences, a lot of stuff about governments, you know, governments of, of, of other civilizations and political ideas and think of reproduction and gender and religion and, and, and sexuality, so forth, speculation in, in science fiction on the social sciences as well. Oh, we got an update on this, on the, uh, the space whiskey. So apparently it's Ardbe Ardbeg Distillery on Islay sent a vial to the International Space Station in a cargo spacecraft in October 2011. So there you go. There's there has been space whiskey, not very much, hmm. but uh, space whiskey is a is a thing. And uh, you know what? That that's actually something that I don't think anyone or no, actually it has been gotten into. Um, people making illicit alcohol in space is a topic that has been covered in some sci-fi. Hey, the closest I got into space is is going when you're down in Antarctica and you're in those, particularly if you winter over. Or you're in, you're out in them. I'm not talking about going along a little zodiac and seeing penguins and icebergs. I'm talking about when you're in the deep interior. Right. Um, you're probably as close as you can to being isolated in space. And and surprisingly enough, um, there is a reasonable amount of alcohol that gets made in in Arctica through different processes. Again, by people adapting, what's you know adapting to generate alcohol right and in, in there and a the thing that in space people would also come up with with more innovative ways to make alcohol um there also are um let's call them because uh, i don't i don't want to be demonetized but there are medicinal <laughs> herbs that I are, are 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 cultivated down in antarctica um and i realize antarctica is is not owned by any one country although the 
everyone that subscribes to the treaty put their claims in abeyance. So it's, it's a it's a it's a continent dedicated to the scientific and cultural enrichment of the planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, as such, there's no laws down there, so there's nothing is is illegal. You can't be prosecuted and put into Antarctic jail for something. Now you may come back to your home country and they put you in jail, but that's a different story. But as I say, um, uh, if you if you think about the types of some of the oldest types of professions, making wine, making alcohol, making medicines for recreational use, um, and yes, sex. Um, those are things that are, are early in civilizations and you find them in Antarctica and they're up in space as well. I mean, come on, we know, oh, yeah. we know what happens up there, but, but what happens up there stays up there. So. <laughs> and, uh. But science fiction has, has explored those things and, 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 and pretty good details. So, um, actually you remind me, um, specifically with the sex thing is that, um, in, uh, the moon is a harsh mistress. The uh, the prospect of the the rarity of females among the population of the moon, which is a, a Robert Heinlein movie, or not movie, sorry, book, um, because mm -hmm. the population is primarily established on the moon as the moon is a penal colony, but because people who were born there essentially can't go back to Earth, um, yeah. there is a sustaining population, but it always receives new influx of mostly male inhabitants, and so there's a, a very interesting. Um, dynamic that establishes itself where while still in some ways somewhat patriarchal uh there are serious serious taboos about uh the things that you can and can't do uh with female humans and regards to uh, yeah. a lot of things but i think it is time for that quick intermission um so i am going to mute myself and Landon, and you guys can be treated to the new slightly longer intermission video. I want to take a moment to talk about something serious. There is a problem facing late surviving non-avian dinosaurs in modern America. Hunting is very strictly regulated, and only allowed at certain times of the year. This means that for much of the year we have to rely on farm-raised food, which means money. If you want to help a starving dinosaur, please consider donating on Patreon, or buying from my merch store. Links are in the description. Please help. Dinosaurs all over YouTube are depending on you to help them through the hunting off-season.
ओह नानी तार ओह कुछ ही इसका All right, well, we are back. Oh, Landon, you got the volume up. That's all right. All right. <laughs> so I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, by the way, that Godzilla clip took me several months to put together because I couldn't upload the file to my uh, render farm because it was too big. So I had to manually render it here locally on my computer. And now apparently I'm hearing something that might be indicating that I have an instance of uh, Facebook open, which yeah, I'm gonna close that so we don't get any more Facebook right. sounds. Sorry about that, everybody. But um, so Landon, uh, during the intermission, <clears throat> right before we came back, you had mentioned that there was a couple things that you wanted to touch on. So let's uh, let's go ahead. Yeah. Well, because we were talking about the inspiration, but we also we should mention that science fiction gets errors, right? Oh yeah. These, these science fiction and prognosticators, pretty good prognosticators, get, get things wrong. Um, but 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 the one of the things in I think in in space exploration they get wrong often is Venus being a place of of you know, the the love place of the <laughs> the, the women's society and all the sort of the marvelous uh, creatures of, of of Venus instead of being and, a hellhole. And yeah. And so we just kind of know, like, nah, yeah, no. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you wanted to find a place in the solar system that most closely matched the description of hell that you find in, uh, like, Christian literature, especially the lurid medieval Christian literature about hell, Venus would be the place. Venus. Earth. But, you know, on the other hand, um, you know, there is a active pros project to build a rover that can land on the surface of Venus and last for some period of time. That, and that would be amazing. And, and there's, you know, um, a a collaboration between the Russian cosmologic city of Kaluga. Um, it's where Gagarin, you know, the, the house did all this sort of stuff. It's it's a it's a it's a really great place to go if you're into rocketry and 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 space stuff. And of course, Los Alamos, which is another great laboratory in the U.S. I've been there. And they're working on doing uh, uh, materials, and they have uh, they have using modern materials. They now have some some very successful rods because they have they have ovens that they can build Venus like atmospheres with all the high pressure, high temperature, nasty acid stuff, and and building a lot of stuff out of you know motors and stuff out of uh, ceramics that can survive in the Mar in the Venus um, temperature. So um, that would be really good because um, it's it's a it's a surface of a planet that's so close. That we'd like to get to, but science fiction um, totally blew it as far as what is there. Um, and I think also Mars, the canals on Mars, and so forth. But that was inspired by people thinking the lines, which were right. optical illusions, were 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 seeds. But that's a I I always like to keep it to. So when I think about errors in sci-fi, I'm always more forgiving when the error couldn't have been known at the time. Yes. Um, and so we get things like um, like the canals on Mars, which inspired things like H.G. Uh, Wells and, you know, because mm -hmm. the idea was that these canals were being built from the poles to other regions to, to provide water to this water starved, dying civilization on Mars. And so that's the kind of civilization that you might think would invade Earth if such a thing were possible. Sure. And so um, but I guess I think flying cars are probably the one thing that oh yeah you just think about flying cars would be a disaster people and give them three you know give 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 people a 3d uh driver's license oh my goodness also i mean yeah. think about this no. right <laughs> let's say that you're 
you're in New York and you have your nice ground-based car and you get in, you get T-boned going through an intersection in New York. Worst case scenario, people in both cars die. Okay, now let's say you have a flying car flying up above Manhattan and you get T-boned. It's probably not going to be just you in the car that's going to die. It's going to be a whole bunch of bystanders. You might crash into a building. I think flying yeah. cars are actually a terrible idea. Yeah, yeah. But I also want to say uh, hi to David. Uh, oh, yes, and, David McGinnis and, is here. And, and be, be sure you understand when you say sorry, you have to say trademark Canada. <laughs> they have they have a trademark on it's true on, and actually i want to i want to acknowledge we got a, we got a fair few people here we i've seen uh mank yeah. deems i've seen what? miguel uh eric v uh, virtaler oh, is yes. here actually eric virtaler and i are working on um a stream on saturday with erica from gutsick gibbon i don't know if you've uh you've met erica landon oh i well, should at some point you should uh she's a master's student in primatology right right now she's uh oh. doing her final project which has unfortunately been tragically delayed because uh originally she was supposed to travel to uh, malaysia to study a, a resident population of uh honestly i don't remember what species of monkey yeah. it was but of course due to current events that has uh been indefinitely delayed <laughs> so yeah but um yeah we are hoping to uh, get a stream together for Saturday where we are going to uh, take a virtual tour of a creationist museum. <laughs> Ooh, excellent. Yes, we've already excellent. done one part of this tour. They And uh, so over the course of this week, I'm going to be looking at a few more of the videos that they put up. So I want to give a shout out. Also, we have uh, sure. Maya is here. And Maya is, uh, you know, one of my most loyal uh, moderators. She is here for virtually everything. So uh, yeah, I just want to give and, shout out to chat. And just 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 clarify because I know you know I was I was permanently banned from YouTube for making a joke about Australians allegedly. Um, so when I was saying sorry, trademark Canada, I don't mean that Canada is sorry. Um, I mean that Canadians they say they they seem to culturally say sorry a lot, right? And they so do. Yes. they have they have they have trademarked it. So mm -hmm. if 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 the U.S. president ever said sorry, he might be in international violation of their cultural trademark. Yes. <clears throat> so, I'm sorry, I got a little... But, but I mean, trademark Canada. <laughs> right, yes, trademark Canada. Yeah. <laughs> um, another, thing, another exploration, again, I want to I inspire people who are maybe familiar with some of the classic you know, movies and books to look at some of the early inspirations of, of science fiction. And that is the age of exploration on the high seas of, of, of ships, particularly mm -hmm. you know, naval vessels and, and, the, um, and the merchants and whalers there, they have, they, they built little pods of society that, that travel in the high seas, ran into unexpected dangers, had to deal with the, a lot of adversity and create a lot of adversity as well. Uh, it was a pretty miserable environment. But if you look at the, histories and chronicles of things around in the in the 1500s 1600s 1400s 1300s and 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 and, and even later like up in the 1800s you'll see the the experiences of people traveling on the seas is sort of a precursor to traveling out in space yeah these, you have to take your water and your food and keep it good i mean air isn't a problem yeah. but everything else is and if, for example on 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 british <laughs> naval vessels in the 18, you know, around, let's say around, around the late 1700s, or 1800s, um, they had various um, norms of behavior that were induced by the fact that, you know, talking about certain things created problems. You were going to have to be on this group with a group of people for months at a time. And, and so they particularly said no discussion of politics and no discussion of religion. Leave that, the, the expression is leave that to the docks. Yeah. Um, because that sort of thing only invited problems in society. And they, they, they learned they have these societal things. They also, of course, unfortunately also established these very rigid hierarchies where the, where the nobility and the upper class, the officers enforce a rule on the peasants, the, 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 the sailors. Oh, I remember. The I was in the, the Navy. Marines. I was in the Navy. There. I remember <laughs> the, the, the Marines were there to essentially, uh, you know, uh, prevent the, masses from uprising against the the right. officers and and my one experience 
on a on a on a on a sub. I I, I was I was on a project and we had to go underneath the North Pole. Was that the crew of the sub was entirely competent. The captain of the sub was pretty knowledgeable, but in between the captain and the crew were these collection of people called officers <laughs> that, Sorry. that couldn't tell you one end of the sub from the other. Their mm -hmm. biggest function was to yell at people, yep. order stuff to be done, and the and the crew would wait until they're they pretend to do something, wait until they're done, and then not do it because often what they said was stupid. Yep. Oh, I'm very familiar with the phenomenon, <laughs> having been in the Navy myself. Although I will tell you a secret about uh, the, it's not really a secret, but now the best use of the Marines is uh, for, for amusement. So here's something you can do with Marines on a ship, right? If you get a few buddies together and you stand near a door as if you're forming a queue, you will get okay. Marines, if you have Marines embarked on your ship, the Marines have a fair chance of lining up behind you because they figure you must be waiting for something. And then if you wait long enough and you get enough of a line of Marines, the, you're, you and your buddies can walk away and there will be a persistent queue of Marines waiting by a door for no reason. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm sorry, I, sorry to my I, brother I, I, who sometimes I, watches I, I, these. My brother was a Marine. I mean, I mean no disrespect to, to the Marine Corps on there. And in fact, um, in the case of the British Navy, they had a per, for, important function because the people who had the knowledge about navigation and how to manage a ship and all the complex, um, you know, supplies and so forth and charts um, needed protected from the, from essentially the impressed, you know, the, because a lot of the sailors at the time in the British Navy were essentially people that were given a choice of, of <laughs> hanging or go on, on board a ship or in some cases not given a choice at all and just right. were put on there. So, so it was a floating jail in some sense. Yeah. And and so um, if you're thinking about if you think about science fiction and a long term space colony, read about the lessons the, of of humans actually humans on on some of these vessels mm -hmm. and how things operated, and then extrapolate that to a modern day thing with a with a multi traditional spaceship. So our, our and, first and tell me tell me where your story goes. So our colony ship should make sure to bring plenty of plenty of limes is one of the things. Yes, yes that's a <laughs> that's an important lesson learned. And actually, um, <laughs> TD Lane says apologies to Dapper's brother because uh, my brother, who's been on this channel by the way, um, or rather one of my brothers, is a uh, a former Marine. So he was on an episode of Leaving Young Earth Creationism uh, because he also did that. It wasn't just me. So, um, yes. And also he, he appeared with one of the best mustaches to ever appear on my channel. Wow. Oh yes. He, he, uh, now this is bad news chat. I did a video chat with him, uh, this Sunday and, uh, the mustache is much reduced. So oh. F's to pay respects to my brother's, uh, glorious mustache in the chat. Is, is there any effect on, on mustache growth in the, in space? I haven't heard anything about that. Um, I don't know because because they usually you know, on on space station they sort of shave it off in part because of things like having to put masks on and things like that. But but um, well, I yeah. yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I've never heard anything about hair growing particular or noticeably faster or more slowly in space. But I uh, yeah. I don't know. If anyone yeah. in chat wants to find a, a link on that, um, no, it's Eric Vertaler. It's not shaved. It's trimmed. But it's trimmed considerably back from where it was. Yeah. By the um, way, I've been I've been reading the 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 Canadians discussing. Sorry, like <laughs> there it is. It's and and I'd say that's that's it's anyway. It's a fascinating culture. Up there. Well, um, I will say we do actually have a Canadian who does technically have a, a, the link to this, and so if that particular Canadian decides to jump in, we we might be able to ask one directly. Ah, all right. So so you had to talk about questions for the uh, audience. Yes. And. and and I'm going to gra gra um, go for this grappa. Oh. This is a really nice uh, Rosano grappa. Um, and this is made from, from the, 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 uh, a, a particular type of, uh, of, of, of grapes uh, in Piemonte region of, of Italy. And it is an amazing. It's aged in, in, in barrels because um, you get that, that lovely color. 
So that is nice. And I also like that, you know, we've, we've got the label Aquavit, which, you know, the water of life. You need this yes. stuff. You'll, you'll yeah, die this if, is, you, if you don't this get is, enough. This, this is our, this, that particular distillery was established in 1779. Oh, it's probably Aquavite because it's Italian, and I'm I'm in French mode yeah. for no reason. That's fine, but but Piemonte is actually one of the more French-like regions of yeah. Italy. Well, actually, or I, yeah. Oh, sorry. One time I was uh, I was trying to read Italian, but for some reason I was tr my my brain had shifted to French, and I was like, why does this not make any sense? And then I I stared at it for a little bit. And I was like, oh wait, no, it's Italian. And so I, I shifted brain gears a little bit, and then I was once again able to, because I can, I can barely speak a word of Italian, but I can read it reasonably well. Yeah. So. All right. So what kind of questions we have uh, from the audience? Let's see if they can answer. Absolutely. So yeah. Um, so we do have one. We might have answers, and some of the answers might even be correct, but others are. <laughs> That's always a possibility. Uh, so I just do. I do want to say uh, for questions, I. My normal thing is I go in the order that they're asked, unless there's a super chat, in which case that will jump up to the top of the queue if there is a queue. So if you donate, you can get your stuff to the front of the line. Yeah, Just although kidding. the line isn't usually super long. And I'm going to also take this opportunity to say, hey, hit the like button, because I have 24 concurrent viewers and only 17 likes according to my YouTube page here. So come on, guys. Give me, give me, give me a break here. Anyway, uh, from Don Giovanni, which is uh, an appropriate name given your, your beverage right now. Excellent. Uh, we Excellent. have... Wonderful Italian name. <laughs> exactly. What cheers, do you... Don. Oh, cheers. Oh. Hmm. oh, and by the way, I am drinking a Gimlet. Ah, excellent. Yes. Uh, which, in case anyone doesn't know, because it's actually a fairly obscure cocktail, it's uh, roughly equal parts gin and lime. With um, usually you do like two parts gin, two parts slime, and about one part simple syrup. So, um, oh, and I, I am seeing more likes now. <clears throat> okay, so uh, from Don Giovanni, what do you think of the idea of 3D printing human genetic material and growing colonists on site? So, uh, that's that interesting thing because, in terms of building complex molecules, printing them um, like a 3D printer manipulates. Um, maybe somewhat in, in, inefficient, but um, being able to manipulate molecules in atomic scale and having that be a catalyst is probably a much more efficient way to do that. And so some of the some of the manipulations of it that like you can do with some of these atomic force uh, probes to move at ions around and build molecules is is one way to start something and then use a catalyst to try to replicate that. Um, but in terms of the energy necessary to sort of build a, a just even a, a, a simple cell from uh, first atomic principles would be quite enormous. I, I suspect that if you could have other places of biological accelerations instead, you might be more efficient. But it's, it's a clever idea. Yeah, I, I think the more generalized idea of growing colonists in situ is an interesting one. Um, I do think, though, that in order to get reasonably well-adjusted adults out of this situation, you would need to have people who are dedicated to rearing these children. And I do wonder to what extent they could rear them at a rate higher than would be just biologically feasible sure. under normal reproduction. Because, sure. I mean, anyone who's raised kids will tell you, you know, if if you try to raise, you know, 15 kids who are all about the same age, I mean, that's... That's going to be quite a task, and you need to be able to give them all enough attention for them to become uh, well-rounded adults. So yeah. it's an interesting idea, but I do wonder to what extent can you actually accelerate the population growth through this technique? Yeah. Although, so what's more dangerous, a self-driving car or a self-parenting robot? I would say the self-parenting robot in the long term. <laughs> um, and, it's but, called television. <laughs> well, one thing that I would say... Um, that that idea could allow for is uh, you could allow for a higher amount of genetic diversity because you could include the genetic uh, template, I suppose, of a much wider range of humans genetically than could feasibly be put on the ship as adults. Mm. So it could help with genetic diversity, even if it doesn't help with the acceleration of the population of a new colony. 
So I think that would be where the real utility comes in, would be with storing a, a wide range of genetic templates that you could then yeah. build from. Yeah, um, and a notion of digitally encoding them and then having a process to restart them is something that's, that's, that's quite, quite interesting to, oh, yeah. to, to do. And it's certainly something that science fiction has explored um, in, in, in great, great Well, we, great humans have been able to um, synthesize complete genomes for relatively simple organisms. Yep. So it's, I think, maybe not 3D printing, but the ability to synthesize a genome from basically a soup of nucleotides and phosphates is something that humans have accomplished. So uh, it's certainly something I think is within the realm of possibility in the long term to be able to take a digitized genome and create the genome as a physical set of molecules. Mm. Um, so let's see. Um, we have a question from TD Lane. Can uh, This is a question for Landon. Uh, I'll still, I must still my way in. Can we send the flat earthers to Venus? Hmm. Um, well, the answer is yes. Um, do we want to, to waste the energy and the oxygen on them? I don't know. I mean, it reminds me of the Douglas Adams thing where they had this, the, the spaceship full of all the people in society that they didn't want, including telephone sanitizers, who apparently was. <laughs> yes, I remember that one. <laughs> I'm not quite sure where. Telephone sanitizers are how they got that on that list, but but somehow Douglas Adams had it in for telephone sanitizers. Um, but but that notion of sending people off in a way that the society didn't want is actually something that that, that shows up in science fiction a lot. Um, you know, if you're going to send it to, to, to Venus, consult some scientists because we can actually put some probe stuff on it and get some real value back as opposed to merely getting rid of. Well, I, I um, do have a question. Now, you said why we would expend the fuel, and I agree we would have to expend the fuel to get the flat earthers to Venus. But why do we need to expend any oxygen? Uh, I guess it depends upon your, your notion of send. Well, as long as they arrive. I mean, if you want to send something out, a real gun, uh, and don't care about the you know, G-forces it has, and then eventually hit Venus, then... Yes, but Venus might might not like that. So. <laughs> so the Venusians might object. Okay, yes. fair enough. <laughs> I like that. Um, let's see. Let me take a look at what we've got. Um, uh, okay, so from <clears throat> Mangel, fr sorry, Miguel Francesco Ogar. Hogar? I'm not really entirely sure what to do with that. I'm going to go with Ogar for now. Uh, if catfish were port put into an alien world... Uh, how would you see things turn in? Or, so I think it's how would they how would they develop? And um, I think one of the big questions is, uh, could they survive at all? And if we assume that it's similar enough to Earth, uh, I think catfish are actually fairly adaptable. And so if they can meet the initial hurdles of just not dying immediately from whether it be radiation poisoning or incompatible gas mixtures in the water or uh, infection from microbes or whatever, and we can assume that the the biosphere that exists there is sufficiently similar that they can, you know, get sufficient nutrition. I I think it would be interesting. Um, not an experiment I would suggest because, of course, there are some ethical implications with introducing invasive species anywhere. Never mind an alien world. But um, I think they might do fairly well as long as it's you know, you meet those basic conditions. And I think that over the course of a few million years, you might get an interesting clade of catfish descendants. But it's hard and to say exactly what would happen. I was interested on, on the radiation environment of that of that planet as well as, as mm. how they would evolve, right? So they survive. The question is, I think, is you know, how would they evolve? And it depends upon the uh, radiation levels that are yeah. that are available to scramble. Because right? that's, that's in this imperfect chemical replication is 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 a key to life evolving well or one, getting out of, getting out of, out of a niche it might be stuck in right well one thing i would say um this and this isn't directly an answer but um so as you may or may not know i'm currently running a speculative evolution project uh which i'd mentioned earlier in the stream but um 
So I talked about the part where we're taking an alien planet about 480 million years through time up to what in the, the slightly future sci-fi setting that I have is, is mm -hmm. the present, right? But I'm, after that's done, I'm actually going to be introducing a speculative zoology project. And actually, mm. well, a speculative evolution, but it will be zoology and botany um, that will actually involve in the same sort of world, taking a very small selection of Earth life and seeding them on a planet and letting them evolve for about 175 million years or so. Okay. So um, if that kind of thing is something that interests you, I would say that's, that'll be a while. But stay tuned, um, you know, keep watching the speculative evolution stuff that I have. That's the next one is coming out actually this Thursday. The uh, the video for it is compiling as we speak. <laughs> so um, it should be uploaded uh, sometime around tonight and then I'll premiere it on Thursday at uh, five Pacific, I think. Mm -hmm. So that uh, that might be of interest to you, uh, Miguel, is that in the future there will be speculative zoology content on this channel. Uh, I can't technically say that the current Spec Evo, Evo project is zoology because technically there are no real animals. I would say, as a, as a planetary scientist, I would be very interested in um, areas of geomorphology. That is, that is, the the how the geology of a planet, you know, changes, right? And 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 the geologic changes within a within a planet. Um, and we have when we went to planet Pluto, and yes, Pluto is a dwarf planet. Dwarf planets are planets just like dwarf stars are stars and dwarf galaxies are galaxies and dwarf people are people. So dwarf planets are planets. Um, and, 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 and even Tyson is getting to get over that. Um, but, <laughs> but, but when we, we thought we understood Pluto or the type of world it was until we visited it, we found that it was a active geological planet <clears throat> yeah. with surprising amounts of, of, of features and that's just one example of we thought it was this but 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 turns out reality is is quite surprising so one of the things that that, that to try to explore some of these exoplanets these planets orbiting other stars is to sort of find how well how can planets change what 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 is you know from their formation to you know through through the the, the life cycle of the star what happens to those planets? Because that's going to have an impact on your society, your civilization, or yeah. if you have one, or even life. It buys the ability to, 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 to start. Well, Landon, if you'd like, um, I, I will be very shortly looking for people to consult with about things like uh, geology and plate tectonics and stuff for the Speculative Evolution Project. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I would I would say you know maybe you could be someone who uh, helps us out with that. Yeah, I can give you some some part of that stuff. But I understand that, and this is one of the things why we want to explore space is that our biases are earthbound. That's our experience, and we just assume that something forty Kelvin can't be active. Well, it turns out we were wrong. So yeah. so 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 treat Pluto with some respect. A dwarf planet, but by the way, most most rocky planets are dwarf planets. Yeah, Earth is kind of the oddball. Pluto is the more common. Uh, from TP Seeker, we have thoughts for the poor tardigrades that were part of Israel's uh, moon lander that crashed. Yeah, press F in the chat for the poor tardigrades. Yeah, um, they seem to be hardy, but there's a there's an extent at which they are. Uh, be able to be hardy, and I understand. I I, I asked because we we I, I consult with um, astrobiologists. Yeah, that's a actual field of people mm -hmm. who are, are are understanding and looking at the biology and considering the biology in in the cosmos in general. And and their comment is that that those critters are um, likely going to be in permanent. Um, they basically go into this this state of suspended animation, right? Yeah. They're they're leave, they're kind of dead, if you will, um, but revivable. Right, but and they so, likely never will be revived, I suppose. And so, unless you went to Mars and and picked up the stuff and revived them, or the moon. they're going to stay. Or the moon, excuse me, moon. It was moon. It was moon. Um, unless you go to moon, 
they're likely going to stay in that state um, forever as a sort of non-animated, uh, formerly live critter. A, a memorial, if you will, to the noble but flawed attempt of an Israeli company to reach the moon. Yeah. And, and it's, it goes back to say is that, that space exploration is hard. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's getting, we're getting better at it, but, but um, the, the Apollo mission was an extraordinary uh, achievement. And, you know, hopefully we can do more amazing things like that in the future. Well, one thing I would say, um, if you think that space exploration is easy, my recommendation is get yourself a copy of Kerbal Space Program, which is a yes. new Newtonian physics-based space flight simulator. Attempt to do all sorts of missions and then realize that Kerbal Space Program tones down the difficulty by several orders of magnitude. And then yeah. get back to me about how easy space exploration is. Because, because I say that, that the thing I always want to do in, in, in Kerbal is to not, is to basically land on remote planets. Or the remote, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's what I wanted to do was I wanted to reach out to the, to, to the other planets. And, uh, and that's, again, that's a non-trivial uh, problem. And of course, if you throw in a mix, um, having machine that works, right, right. You know, this is part of the thing: is, is is write a piece of software running a piece of hardware that must work correctly the first time. Yeah. In an environment you're not quite sure why we're not sure because you're exploring, right? We right. don't know. We didn't know what Pluto was like. So we set something there and has to handle all the stuff that we might. That's part of the, the difficulty of, of things. Um, and that's one of the things that I think it would be, I think science fiction authors have to assume success of a mission because if every mission was, they well, rocket launched and they died. The rocket launched, they got in space a little bit and then they died. The rocket launched and it blew up. Eventually, you're going to run launched. out of volunteers. <laughs> you're going to run out of stories. You're going to run out of people, readers saying, this is pretty boring. Um, the number of, I mean, the number of probes that didn't really make it to Mars in a very good spot that we sent is surprisingly embarrassing for a technologically advanced, so unquote, um, uh, <laughs> right. group. So, so, um, so one of the things you find in, in science fiction is they have to, if they just if it was mimicking real life too much, there'd be also be long periods of nothing going on. That's 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 the the, right. the space exploration is 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 divided. Um, you know, Ald Aldrin told me that that space is long long stretches of boredom, punctuated by moments of terror. Yeah, just like uh, war. <laughs> yeah, and much much of life sometimes. Well, hopefully it's not too long of boredom. But we have a uh, question from uh, Beige Price, who says, uh, even if we do send people to Mars, how weak will they be when they hit the gravity there? <coughs> well, that's actually a good point. Um, one of the reasons why we've been trying to learn on Interstellar Space Station We like the astronauts to be in good condition. We don't want them to be blind, senile, uh, you know, break their bones as soon as they stand up and, and you know, die from stuff. We like them to be functional. And so um, that's, a big, that's a currently a, a, a big concern. I think the, uh, if we could get self-sustaining capsules um, going forward, um, that's going to be a, an important part to be able to actually reach Mars successfully. Remember again, you know, Apollo was a couple of days to the moon. They have enough stuff in their bubble that they could last for a couple of days and come back before they run out. Right. That's, 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 that was, that's the best that humans have been able to do as far as colonization on the way out there. Mars is a whole number of levels up above that. And um, and so we've got to be able to handle the long term space flight, and moreover, have a practical colony. You can't be going back and forth to Mars every time you need another drink of water, right? Every time you have more fuel, you know, 
fool and so forth. That's not practical. Right. You need to be able to build a system that can go to Mars, land, most likely dig underground, because most likely the way that humans can survive on Mars is underground. Sure, you can come up and explore stuff, but it, it, you better be living underground, if nothing else, to shield you from the radiation and to have a capsule that can handle pressure, atmospheric pressure, so you can at least live in a relatively comfortable environment. Well, uh, actually, Landon, that, that reminds me once again of the Spec Evolution Project, because I, I've detailed a bit of the, the, the present day setting. And uh, there are human uh, colonies on Mars, and they are, in fact, primarily underground. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep some things reasonably realistic in this setting. Uh, not that it's being very well fleshed out. Uh, this is a quick one for me uh, from TD Lane, who says, Eric earlier asked about Hydra Dominatus. Hydra Dominatus is the typical war cry of the Alpha Legion before and during the Horus Heresy. There you go. Hmm. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, TD Lane moves to include Eurypterids in the selection for the Speculative Zoology Project. I think they were already extinct by the time I selected organisms to seed the planet, but I will double check. If not, then I will put them in there. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have an Ola from the Deviants. What's up, the Deviants? Oh, man, how you been doing? You know what? I need to, uh, I need to get back hey, on your channel. Super Chats work, too. Oh yeah. Get, I, hey, you know what? Get, they don't have to give me money if they don't want to. It's fine. But but I'm just I'm just pointing out they work. It's true. Uh, let's see what else do we have. Don't let me get to the bottom of this chat, people. Ask questions. Oh, and of course, um, YouTube just shot me to the bottom. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. So we have a comment from TP Seeker. I'm not sure if it's a question, but it sounds interesting. The Madaka fish, a freshwater fish native to Asia, were sent into space to see how microgravity impacts their impacts marine life, particular how, particularly how their skeletal systems change in a weightless environment. Uh, apparently, it died. So yeah, I I know that that there have been experiments like that uh, going forward, and um, and the. Uh, but you know, I'm I'm I because I focus more on the physics side. I'm not as, as familiar with that. I know, for example, the case of the spiders, that spider webs um, are are interesting. That the spiders that are born here on Earth and go up into the space station with microgravity have a really hard time trying to form a web. Right? Their yeah. their webs are not the nice symmetrical stuff because they're they're used to gravity and things and just it, it basically it it's just a tangled mess of stuff yeah, but, but they observed that about after four generations um the offspring developed the ability to try to create webs that are more functional they're not the classic webs of you have on earth with, with the spiral stuff but but they're nonetheless effective if they were to introduce uh, you know fruit flies into it in in that thing and they they, they seem to be able to start to figure out how to do that? But but the um, one of the one of my uh, colleagues uh, that was in the space station said that the spider webs from the first generation spiders were similar to the spiders webs that were that he saw in a college were grown by um, spiders that were uh, fed the appropriate amount of acid. So acid trip spiders and spiders tripping out in space. They seem to have similar sort of disorganized <laughs> webs. Interesting, <laughs> interesting. Uh, but I think you're forgetting, though, that uh, Landon, that gravity isn't real. It's just uh, density and buoyancy. Apparently, <laughs> according to some. Even though the, the buoyant force <laughs> equation requires should, gravity, not, a, not apparently, but allegedly. Um, All right, we have a two dollar super chat from the Deviants who says, "Hunt some, hunt some monsters soon, sir." And uh, I'm going to go ahead and say, uh, I mean, yeah, let me know. Give me some notice. And um, oh, and cheers for the super chat. I like that. Yes, yes, yes. Davidus, to you. Thank Cheers, cheers, cheers. Uh, yeah, man, we should do that. Because um, so the Deviants and I. And this is this is the this is the group I'm, I'm toasting you. So. Very well. Very nice. 
So uh, the Deviants and I have done a few uh, things where I've gone on to his channel and um, while he's been playing Monster Hunter and I try my best to fit the various monsters he's hunting into some kind of real world classification system. It is not easy. But um, so there you go. And uh, yeah, we should do that. Um, I, I really do think we should do that. Uh, we have another question from Don Giovanni. Is the soft panspermia argument of life a good one? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and assume that by soft panspermia, I think what, what that is, because I'm not familiar, super familiar with that particular term, I think what that means is um, the idea that uh, various molecules that were needed for abiogenesis may have arrived from space rather than yeah. developing on Earth. I personally think it's currently reasonable. Um, one of the big thing is uh, we recently found, uh, what is it? Um, oh, what's the? I can't. I'm having a, a a a you know a brain fart on the name of the sugar that it for helps form the backbone of uh, DNA molecules. Um, Ribose. Yeah, no, is ribose. It's ribose. Ribose. So ribose yes. is a notoriously unstable uh, molecule. But um, recently ribose was found in an asteroid, in a uh, protected part of the asteroid. So it seems that it's only unstable under certain circumstances, and apparently the interior of some parts of space rocks, basically, are the yeah. kind of environment that allows ribose to form and persist. So I think that it's actually a pretty reasonable idea that many of the essential molecules for life could have formed uh, off of Earth and then arrived via uh, impactors. I don't think it has sufficient evidence to be just unanimously, unanimously accepted, but it's, it's interesting. And, and um, I, as I say, in terms of the... Uh... Items, I mean, uh, uh, I participated in a fun project um, that used rail guns, and, and already it's cool because you have rail guns there, and accelerating objects to tremendous speeds and then slamming them into, uh, you know, hard metal blocks. And uh, it's amazing to see, you know, you accelerate something in, in like 10,000 G acceleration out of Oof. a rail gun. And 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 put a hole, a deep hole into a a, a block of, of of steel, and the capsules inside contained various co organic compounds. And the question is, could you know, could they survive these really high impacts? And the answer is that probably is that some of those those long, you know, um, carbon chain organic molecules could survive high temperature. Uh, 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 you know, impacts or high high G impacts, um, these sort of detonation events, and and so when we see um, you know in, in, in Arctic rocks, we see organic molecules. Before we say, oh, it's ice out of space. No, no, no. Yeah, any yeah, basically, if you have a bunch of carbon atoms and a bunch of hydrogen atoms, they'll form an organic molecule. It's just the way chemistry works, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing, nothing going beep, beep, beep inside your rock. But, but the, the, the thing is that, that we've seen organic compounds in meteor, meteorites, things that land in space. We've also seen them in the tails of comets and, and then, and the comet we land in detected them as well. So sort of organic compounds are way out there. And so stuff, senpermia, senpermia uh, of having useful material brought to earth is something actually quite seriously considered especially the the notion that that there's a there's a model that says that a lot of the water on earth arrived from other sources the the era of heavy bombardment included comets and comets are basically dirty snowballs mm -hmm. bring lots of carbon dioxide but also lots of water to to earth yeah all right so we have um let's see uh Quick question from Monk Mayfair, who says uh, astrobiology versus xenobiology, which I, sus I, I assume is a question about are they different or are they synonyms? Um, 
I guess one is isn't 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 now I'm I'm not I'm not a xenobiologist, but isn't xenobiology study of of foreign life in outer space as opposed to study of biology in space? I mean, one is I think doesn't one deal with study of 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 biological systems in other worlds versus study of biology in the environment of space? Is that I mean, I'm not sure. I'm asking a question. I think because I'm not a xenobiologist, so so I don't even hang out with astrobiologists. So right, I'll, um, I'll ask them. Yeah, I'm not sure. That's that's an interesting question, but I think we might have to get back to you on that. And um, uh, you know what? I'd say uh, Monk Mayfair, leave a comment on the video asking the question, and uh, when Landon gets back to me uh, after asking some of his astrobiologist buddies, I can let you know what he said. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, the definition is it's, it's a subfield of biology, um, synthesizing and manipulating biological, you know, biological systems. Um, and so it's a, it's a different, um, there's a xenobiology, exobiology, and astrobiology. Astro meaning stars, exo meaning outside, and, and xeno being both, right? Yeah. So, so I guess astrobiology is sort of biology of, of things out there and exobiology would be things that are there, but not here. Okay. So we have a question from but, Beach but Price. I, I mean, I don't, sorry. We, we, yeah, we didn't guarantee we, we would give you good answers. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We have a question from, um, uh, let's see from Beach Price, who says, "I don't. I know we don't want to introduce stuff to other planets, but why not dedicate a moon and plant it with all kinds of microbes?" Well, um, I mean, that's the most possible. I mean, and I think, for example, um, the 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 ice moon Europa around Jupiter is a very interesting candidate. Now, it may all be biological. It may be biologically active already. It's one of the reasons why it's it's the top priority for the next generation of, of probes visiting is to orbit Europa and eventually land and eventually drill under the ice to see what's down there. Um, it has a, you know, it has a volume of water that's about seven times the volume of water on earth. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a water world with this ice cap. We don't know if it's a thin ice block and nice, nice liquid water underneath, or it's kind of like a slurry slushy thing you might find at a, at a convenience store. Um, the but the thing is that that where the, the the moon itself is one of the most roundest objects we've ever found in in the uh, in in our exploring of space. And the reason why it's so round is that that essentially it is really a a frozen ice ball around liquid water. Yeah. Um, and there's reasons, various reasons why we go into details of why Europa is like that. But Europa is one of the places that that probably I think it has a higher chance of having life on it even than Mars, and and so if it doesn't, it's a place that you could introduce it if you so choose. But you have to think about the 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 effects of uh, of that. I would think you'd want to explore it first before contaminating it. Okay, but that's just me. Uh, we have a question from Lorenzo S, which I think might be more directed at me than you, uh, which is hippos. Which one came, or which one, hippopotamus or hippocampus or hippos? Um, actually, I'm not sure if that's for me. I'm not sure what the question is about. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not a, I, I certainly am not a, a uh, evolutionary biologist. Uh, I, I well, have high respect for them. I mean, the hippocampus came first in terms of chronology. I'm not sure if he means um, in terms of names. In terms of names, hippo, as Greek for horse, came first. Uh, so, Lorenzo S., if you if you want to clarify that, uh, feel free to type that. Yeah. Um, so, but hippocampus is first chronologically, and hippo is first uh, in terms of linguistics. Uh, let's see. Okay. By the way, I got a comment from my colleague that said astrology deals with the search of naturally evolved life in the universe, mostly on other planets, whereas you know. Biologists are concerned with detection and analysis elsewhere in the universe. Xenobiology attempts to design forms of life with different biochemistry and different genetic code. Okay. So astrobiologists might be analyzing 
and that that makes sense because we we talked to them about exosolar planets and habitable zones that sort of thing. Uh, a xenobiologist would attempt to um, design life given an environment, um, perhaps even with a completely different genetic code. So people talk about three D printing of of life and so forth. That's that's apparently a xenobiology. Okay. Well, According to one of my colleagues. Well, hey, I mean, he probably knows more than I do. He's a he he, he is a, a astrobiologist. Uh, there, he's not a xenobiologist. Okay. But he uh, knows what he's talking. About. So we have a question from uh, T D Lane who asks, "Can Landon stream Kerbal Space Program?" <laughs> uh, yes, although although um, we did it from a, I was actually from interns. Where we used uh, basically the our, our we have I have, I have a large computational cluster. We usually developed computational cluster to do orbital stuff. So we basically went and figured out the orbits and then drove the Kerbal stuff. We had to figure out how to because Kerbal has some. You have to understand its granularity of of its it, its its world is is not analog. It's it's digital. Right. You have to understand that the digital thing. You have to understand some of its parameters, but once we were, so we had to study Kerbal Space. Now, the Kerbal Space Program as, as a program is fairly faithful to non-Newtonian mechanics. I think you mean Newtonian mechanics. I mean, I've seen fairly faithful to Newtonian mechanics, not right. non-Newtonian stuff. So, so, but, but in terms of Newtonian stuff, it, it does, it does a pretty good job of, of it. Um, but in terms of trying to, um, so, so, so we went and developed orbital programs to then translate that into Kerbal Kerbal stuff, and it and it worked, right? We could get you you could calculate how to get from here to there without splatting, mm -hmm. and and then you just have to then say, okay, given the Kerbal parameters, what kind of rockets do you need, and what kind of of this and that do you need? And of course, they give you the the building blocks, and you have to basically study the building blocks as properties, and then work backwards to say, okay, if that's your rocket. You don't have enough fuel and you need to get more boosters, but eventually you get enough stuff and um and then you you launch it and then you send uh basically fuel up so you can launch it from launch it from a space platform yeah. to the remote, remote planet and then you can get there. Um and then you just at, at that point it just becomes a calculation. And of course the 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 nice thing about Gerbil is it actually, you know, you take it takes a long time to get there because in reality, yeah. far away places take a long time. But computers can be patient. And so I can't claim I landed on the on the most distant planet, but our programs patiently nudged Kerbal to land on the most distant planet successfully. Okay. Well, Landon, I'm gonna put this out here. If you decide that you want to stream Kerbal Space Program and you need a place to stream it to, I will make either of my channels available to you. And uh, the only condition I have is that uh, you, you send me a link to a hangout or something where I can can uh, watch as well as talk with you while you do it. Yeah, I mean, but so. but it, it, it was it was a matter of just doing oral mechanics and then and then figuring out what input parameters when you give a when you give Kerbal a this much of a pulse what happens right and you mm -hmm. calibrate that and then you figure out the 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 rockets parts and what they do once you get that done. Then it became obvious that you couldn't blast off of the surface very well and get there. You needed to basically build a, a platform. You then go back and forth to load up fuel and then launch from from orbiting platform right. to 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 get there. But once you do that, then it becomes just a matter of saying, okay, you know, in in two weeks is going to arrive there, and it takes a long time. Oh yeah, game time. But but computers are patient, and so you go yay. Uh, we have a quick comment from Beach Price who says, I like Landon. He never treats any questions as silly. Smiley face. Well, science is about questions. It's not about answers. You are being scientific by asking the questions. I'm just giving you speculations about stuff based upon my experience. But science values questions. And the greatest scientists are the people who ask the right question at the right time to the right person. So ask questions because it's very scientific. I agree. All right. And I think we have what is probably our last question, unless we get a super chat in. So if you do have a question after this that you really want answered, it's going to have to be a super chat because otherwise we're probably going to end the stream 
because I like to keep them around two hours and we're already at uh, an hour 59 plus so this question is from Vandalia1998 who by the way go check out Vandalia1998's uh, channel I have been on his channel several times so uh, yeah go check that out uh, he says in sci-fi is there a conversion evolution since most I think he, he skipped the word since I think most aliens seem to evolve uh, in a humanoid like form eventually um, I have my thoughts but I'll, I'll let you go ahead uh, Landon well um, I'm my astrobiologist tell me that you know life forms try to get you know life evolves the easy way it doesn't try to figure out what's the most complex way we can do this what's the most energy efficient and most likely way to get to get there and as a result there are things that are possible that are not practical correct like from the physics point of view it is possible to build complex chains of silicon molecules but Silicon has some problems. I mean, just because of, of the way the physics is, that's not as convenient as carbon. And silicon has some, some stable bond stuff and some double bond stuff, which messes up your ability to make those nice rings and chains and so forth. So as an example, yes, it's possible there's silicon life form. But the physics says the easier, more energy efficient, more likely way to do it is with carbon. That doesn't mean that they, 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 uh, they're, they're exactly like us. Right. But the the idea that that if you have an imperfect replication of complex chemistry, it's most likely going to involve some of the most common elements in the universe. Oxygen. I mean, hydrogen is the first most common thing. Helium is second, but it's it isn't a it doesn't really deal with chemistry, so it's kind of on the side. Oh, but, there are a few helium compounds but, 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 out there. But 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 oxygen and carbon. And nitrogen are are again those elements. If you look at the what's out in the universe, are the most common. And you look at the nucleosynthesis and how you build up from from you know small atoms up to big atoms. It's the it's the you know the easiest way to do it is with the elements you have on Earth. So our biology is a is a product of physics, right? It's 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 the and and in if you look at 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 life on earth is composed of the most common elements in the cosmos sans helium um the most common chemically reactive elements let's say in in, in the universe so why would you try to s come up with something like a silicon-based life form great for science fiction but pretty impractical on the physics side okay i'm gonna go ahead and give an answer for this and then um Assuming we don't have a super chat in the meantime, I think that'll be pretty much it. I'll give some quick. Oh, hey, Chesh. Chesh Arvik Hi, is Chesh. here. Hey, Chesh. Oh, you, Chesh. Chesh a nice, nice person. Chesh has the link. If she wants to come in and say, hey, oh, uh, you know, live, she can. Yeah, come in. Uh, you should also check out her channel and she does. Absolutely. Check stuff. out. If you're not if you're not already checking out Chesh Arvik's channel, you should go do so. She does some really good art stuff. Uh, she has a monthly show called That Time of the Month, which is a clever title, I think. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, she does some. She's also done some good uh, commentary stuff. Uh, she has a one episode so far of her show, Too Long Didn't Read, which I think was yeah. really good, except for slightly low sound levels. But we've talked about how to fix that. Um, and I think she might have some ideas for future stuff there. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, go check out Cheshire and, and she have it. Yeah, she does ninety five percent of the work. Ex that's true. Yeah, she does do not. In fact, she, <laughs> basically, she 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 might as well do ninety five percent of the work on this channel too. Um, but anyway, um, <clears throat> in terms sorry of in inside joke. <laughs> it's okay. Um, oh wait, you didn't say trademark on on your sorry. Oh yeah, sorry Canada. Yeah, trademark Canada. Right. Sorry, exactly. Sorry. <laughs> trademark Canada. Trademark Canada. Um. So, uh, in terms of the humanoid thing, I'm going to approach in a, uh, a fairly strictly evolution, uh, speculative biology sort of thing. Um, the humanoid form has been something that people have discussed whether or not it's particularly optimal for an intelligent technological species or not. And I tend to think that it's probably not. 
and that the two legs, two arms thing is probably um, something that's relatively unlikely. Now, classically, a lot of science fiction has just assumed convergent evolution onto the broadly humanoid form. And, you know, that was just the, the kind of excuse they gave for giving us humanoid aliens. And this has been a particularly a big problem in um, filmed sci-fi, mostly because it's way cheaper to put a funny forehead on an actor than it is to create an entire non-humanoid alien. Um, in fact, even uh, sci-fi shows that did not primarily use humans with funny foreheads, uh, like uh, Farscape, which was uh, produced by the Jim Henson Company, still, even a lot of the alien puppets ended up having two arms and two legs. So, you know... I don't think that that's particularly realistic. Um, I, I think that the, the sort of tetrapod design of four limbs is mostly a coincidence of the organisms that ended up dominating macrofaunal niches on Earth. I don't think that necessarily that would be repeated on other planets. So I, I expect that if we encounter truly alien, uh, sapient organisms on other you know, worlds, that they probably would not be humanoid overall. But, um, yeah. So, oh, wrote no, no last name, said his phone died, so he missed most of the show. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. And, uh, oh, Chesha sent us three heart emojis, which means that she has, like, surpassed her quota for the day of heart emojis towards wow. me. Wow. Yeah. And that's, 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 I mean, you're, you're in love with a, a dinosaur. That's, that's, uh, no, that's, Very that's, of you. That, that's what it is. So you just realized you, you started a shipping meme, right? <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Definitely. Definitely. I'll, I'll ship Chesh and dinosaurs. Okay. So, so there you Chep go. There you go, chat. Uh, start writing the, the fan fiction about uh, Cheshire Vic, a goblin falling in love with a dinosaur. In space. <laughs> yes. In space. Yeah. That, that, add that in there. So write write a uh, a wonderful romance novel about a goblin and a dinosaur in space falling in love. Good luck. Uh, but let's see. Let's go to channel news, uh, and then we'll let Landon plug whatever he would like. Uh, let's see. Um, channel news. So Thursday, the next speculative evolution project update is coming out it is the second update for phase two it is far from the final update if you are watching this and you have submitted creatures to me that have not made it onto the world anvil or my twitter or anything like that do not worry i am getting to you <laughs> it's a bit of a process i have received far more submissions than i ever expected um, obs successfully reconnected so if there was an interruption in the stream I'm sorry, uh, OBS disconnected. I'm not sure which one, because I have two instances open right now. So hopefully it was everything's fine. But uh, anyway, uh, Saturday, I am trying to get at noon Pacific a stream with Eric Viertaler 92 and Erica from Gutsit Gibbon, where we will be continuing our tour of a creationist museum up in uh, Montana, I think. Uh, if Eric, if you're still here and you want to correct me, Please do. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> uh, then next Tuesday should be our next Kent with Bent, unless something comes up where uh, Bent can't do it. Uh, that should be Kent with Bent 26, the one that almost didn't happen ever. Um, then after that, I don't know what will be on Thursday or Saturday. Um, yeah. I have stuff in backup, and unless something else happens, it'll be that. Um, also, if you're in contact with me under any of my personal accounts, remind me to actually make the video about the guy who's been scamming people in uh, a few different nerd as well as uh, paleontology circles. Yep. So uh, remind me to do that because I need to actually get that done. Uh, so that's pretty much it for channel news. And uh, Landon, what would you like to plug? Well, a couple of, of, of things. Again, I'm not, I don't have a channel of my own, but I, I live vicariously through other people's channels. Um, and so I like to call it a couple of things uh, for you to catch out, check up. Um, that might be a variety. Um, one is a guy named Karel, K A R E L, um, who is number one uh, talk show host in Antarctica. 
Uh, I've been working with him, and I do a help uh, with my friends down in the South Pole, and 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 him. He's 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 a very interesting commentator. Uh, another person I would, another group I would recommend checking out is Milwaukee Atheists. Um, they do an atheist Sunday school. They do a lot of of really not your classical atheist stuff, but actually, for example, um, read the Bible and actually read it. We're going through. They got me to read a couple of chapters on there, and uh, it's kind of it's kind of interesting experience. Um, End time is a is a great group of, of folks that are doing interesting stuff. Uh, a comic I recommend that you two comics I recommend you you check out. One is a guy named Pent Monk. Another guy is named Isaac Butterfield. Um, both interesting uh, folks. And then uh, if you want scam baiting, uh, scam bait central. And finally, um, uh, Nation Media, which is co-hosted by David McInnes. Um, they're doing some fun stuff. Uh, they have a really uh, fun channel that's that's emerging that I suggest you check out. All right. And I'm going to read one final comment, which is from Cheshire Vic that says, We love Landon with three, or wait, no. Yeah, it is three. Three exclamation points. Ah, uh, thanks, Chess. Yes. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for showing up and hitting that like button. And thank you very much, the Deviants, for super chatting. I will see all of you guys on Thursday for a 20-ish minute long video about speculative evolution and alien creatures yeah. living in the ancient seas of another planet. Thank you very much, so. and keep asking questions. All right, absolutely. And uh, I'll talk to all of you later.